All right, so Lao. Yes. Is that how you pronounce your name? Lao, Lao Mi. Lao Mi, where's that, where's that, what's the origin of that name? Lao Mi is actually, it's a combination of my first name, mm -hmm. which is Lauren Michelle. So there you go, right. Lao Mi. Lao Mi, I love it. <laughs> now Lauren, Lao, where are you from? I'm originally New Jersey, but I will say that I'm from Miami because this is where I grew up in the South, 305. And how long have you uh, been in Miami? Um, uh, let me see, maybe about, I'll say back 22 years. 22 years? Yeah. Do you remember the reason why you moved there? Um, well, when my family migrated down here, um, everyone just came from Jersey City and was like, we're getting the hell out of Dodge. And then came down here. And then um, I finished school, I came out of school early. So I was pretty much like, I could do whatever the hell I want. So then I moved back up top. And then I came back down to like finish some things and got pregnant and never went back. So <laughs> what type of childhood did you have? I have a 21 year old son and yeah, he just turned 21 on Christmas Eve. No, I'm yeah. sorry. I meant you. What, what type of childhood did you have? Childhood. Yeah. Childhood. My childhood was I had a cool childhood. I came up, um, both of my parents in the household, they're still married right now. They actually have been married for 50 years. Um, December 18th, that just passed. Um, my father's a military man, military firefighter. My mom was a homemaker, so, and I have three other siblings. So we came up in a very um, religious, very structured household. So it was good, wasn't deprived of anything. <laughs> We're very like well-rounded. Now most, most of my guests have had some childhood trauma of some sort, something that really impacted them in some sort of way. Did you experience any of that? Um, well, that, that, we're going deep fast. So uh, <laughs> yeah, um, actually, so childhood traumas I had experienced and actually just healed and reconciled from recently of um, sexual child abuse, um, being molested by a family member for several years. So of my childhood, that was probably the most traumatic thing, experience that I've had because that was a secret that was kept from my parents. Um, so, you know, you have, you might have regular traumatic things like a dog bit me or something like, I hate dogs. No, mine was a little different from that. So that was like an experience, it was traumatic that I had kept from my mom up until a certain age. And then it was kept from my father up until an adult age. So that was, I would say that was, pretty traumatic. What age did this start? Um, it happened from, I was probably, it started happening from about six years old till about nine, 10, began to lessen out around that age, around there. And what do you remember from those times? I remember that it was, um, I remember it was, unfortunately, <clears throat> in a lot of black families, um, you know, people may feel differently about that, but in a lot of black families, um, the hunching cousins things or whatever it is, is something that's almost normalized in a weird kind of way. So you don't really recognize that what's happening to you, that it's wrong, especially when it's being done in a way that seems playful and it's just destroying your innocence. You know what I mean? Because then in hindsight, when you get older and you're like, wait a goddamn minute, you know what I mean? Then you realize you're being taken advantage of. Right. So <clears throat> it it is something that has it has molded me in the way that I am as an adult now. Um, but it's not anything that I couldn't heal from and to, you know, just to move forward and to bring awareness to other people that may have experienced this in their households, um, you know, staying with family and different things like that. Um, <clears throat> that they can still heal from it and have closure. Um, actually, after all this had gone on, I had confronted my abuser um, maybe about eight or nine years ago. And it was terrible. It just like, it just blew up in a different kind of way. But it was something that I had been dealing with since I was an adolescent. So at that point, I was, I was completely healed. I just needed to let you know that I'm acknowledging what you did to me and it has fucked me up, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it didn't blow over so well with him because that was something that he probably tried to bury away because I wasn't the only victim 
of the family members of, you know, different cousins that he was doing this to. So as time had gone on, unfortunately, it had taken a very life changing event. My nephew passed away in 2020, um, a violent death. He drowned and it just put a perspective on everyone's life. And a few months after his death, my abuser called to apologize to me because um, I think it, it could have brought to him in that moment that he was kind of outcasted, couldn't come to the funeral. Or, I mean, he could have, but that was his own guilt that he had to deal with. So right. it, it made it come full circle for him of how, you know, death has a way of awakening things in people of how he potentially like screwed my life over. You know what I mean? With different things that come from being sexually abused as a male child or a female child. Like what? What are some of those things? Some of the things um, and most people don't like to get into it but there are you know maybe homosexual relationships that come from it because they may be traumatized by what a male did to them or what a female did to them that they just rather not even go into that because they're going to associate every relationship with their bad experience with the opposite sex um it can make someone hypersexual that makes them feel like that that's potentially all that they're valued with all that they have to offer is sex you know those types of things but it depends on the environment that a child is nurtured in or even adolescent or even adult is nurtured in to help them understand and grow through these things and notice and be able to heal from them so i would say one of the things that i struggled with was trust with just male relationships in general because that's what was done to me and this was a, a close family member that spent summers with us so when you get older and you realize these things it, it can jade you in a sense of if this is someone that's supposed to love me how do i trust them if they're doing things to you that that aren't good that they're taking advantage of you that they're manipulating you so those are those are some of the things that i was actually able to overcome i was able to elude being seriously promiscuous or I was able to evade sexual promiscuity um, and that was because of pretty much my home structure of just the different tools that were presented to me by my parents even though they didn't know about these things it still sets the personality of a child you know of different that you're better than this and you know different things like that and to overcome what happens and then eventually a child can have the courage to go to an adult and express, you know, things that has happened to them in now, the past. When did you begin the process of healing? Uh, probably about 35 years old, <laughs> honestly, because you go through so many different things that you're like in search of the root of like, why am I this way? Why? Mm -hmm. So, you experience different things. That was the door for me for healing when I confronted him seven, eight years ago. That was the, the means of healing for me, confronting him. And what was the reaction of your parents? My mother, well, when I told my mom when I was 14, she was very upset, she cried. Um, and it bothered her because she knew that if she had confronted his mother it just opened up Pandora's box. And then it goes back into like what I was saying about the black community, like um, oftentimes are afraid to deal with things head on. You don't want to deal with the drama because it, it's just, it just would cause so much, so many problems. And, and then you don't want to be faced with somebody calling your child a liar about, you know, it's just, it was just a lot of things attached to it. Right. So that was at the age of 14. And then having to tell my father at the age of, when I, when I did tell him at maybe like 32 years old, he's like, what the hell? Like, where the hell have I been? You know what I mean? But it's, it's whole reasons, daddy. <laughs> Why we didn't tell you this. You know what I mean? Right. Like, you might went to prison or something. You know what I mean? There's, I have a valid explanation. You know, um, and he was he was very hurt. You know, he had to go through his things because I could only imagine like as a father, you know, not being able. You f might feel a guilt that you didn't couldn't protect your protect your child from something that was happening underneath your nose. You know, so I know that he went through his thing. And then for him to find out freaking 30 years later, you know, that's that's disheartening. You know, that was heartbreaking for him as well. But they're cool now.
Everybody's cool. All right. Um, what role does religion or spirituality play in your life? Um, religion, um, sp I'll say spirituality dictates my daily life. That's just it. I believe in Jesus. He's my homeboy. That's how I rock. You know what I mean? I'm more spiritual than I am religious. You know, religious is telling you how to worship. Where I just rather resonate if I have a personal relationship with God, that's my personal relationship with God. You know, I can't tell anyone how to worship. If you worship, that's fine. You know what I'm saying? How you do it, how you communicate with your most high, that's, you know, on you. So spirituality, it, it guides my daily life. I don't move without acknowledging the reason why I woke up or the right. reason why I'm going to sleep. So it pay, it's a it's a it's a daily it's a daily thing. And what are some of your spiritual practices? Um, I I love to I love to do yoga and meditation. And during those times is when I talk to God. Those are because I'm I'm doing other things. I'm I'm exercising my I'm, I'm cleansing myself in that moment. I'm having my me time. That makes the communication for me give me more clarity on things and come back full circle. You know, um, like my mom always says, and I'd be like, something told me, my mom be like, that wasn't something, that was the Holy Spirit. You know, that's what my mom says. So I often look for guidance from the something, the Holy Spirit to, you know, something may weigh upon my heart to say, no, nah, I don't do that or go ahead and try that if you want to. Um, you know, that's, that's how I use that moment for that. A lot of people be like, how do you know God is talking to you? Well, if you're in touch, if you're spiritual, you're in touch, you'll know he's not gonna, he might make a rock cry out to you. He might set a bush on fire. I don't know, you know, however he's trying to speak to you, that's the means that he's gonna use because of he's trying to get you to see something. But I have a different communication. So my signs are gonna be a little bit more different than someone else's signs, you know what I mean? Of right and wrong, or you should or shouldn't do that, and different things like that. Speaking of signs, what is your sign? My sign, I am a Taurus. I'm a bull, May 11th, hardcore. <laughs> what are some uh, characteristics? We are stubborn people, but stubborn in a way of, because we don't like change. We're set in our ways, and if it's nothing wrong with it, we're like, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, you gotta like kind of nudge us to be like, no, there's nothing wrong with it, but there's fresher grass over there. Like, you sure? So like, it, we have to be really assured because we're so loyal to what we are and different things, we have to have that assurance that, okay, I'm gonna eat this grass, okay? So you said it's cool, it's fine, I trust you. If you're lying, I'm gonna get in that ass. That's the stuff that Taurus do. <laughs> you know, we don't play the radio, you know. A bull is a bull at the end of the day. Right. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Who are some of the uh, more notable uh, Tauruses that our audience would know? Um, Chris Brown is a Taurus. Um, Ace Hood is a Taurus. Um, who else? There's a bunch of, there are a bunch of artists. They say like the difference between like April Taurus and May Taurus is that uh, like April Taurus um, want to be seen. May Taurus would like to be heard. So if you think about it in a not so layman way, yeah. it does kind of make sense, you know, and everyone's like, oh, Zodiac signs, everyone has the same personality trait, which may be true, but there are certain traits that are of every Zodiac sign. And when your own conglomerate of a personality is meshed in with it, then it's going to be more than others. You might have some Taurus that are more stubborn about certain things where other Taurus may not be as stubborn about that. But the bottom line is we stubborn as fuck. So it still comes out the same way that like at the end of the day, we're stubborn. We just may be stubborn about different things. We're go-getters. We're very, 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 very tenacious, very go-getting, very independent um, creatures, I should say, <laughs> refer to us as that. Got you. Now, what did you want to be growing up and what are you now? <laughs> That's so funny. So um, the three things that I wanted to be growing up was, this is so funny, a missionary, right? Um, a lawyer or a police officer, right? So the, the beautiful thing about that is that I have actually fulfilled all of those things yeah. in just in different types of light. 
Um, in a former life, I am and you know, working actively as a crime scene investigator. So I got to experience that world of law enforcement, not as a police officer, but just, you know, sworn, not sworn personnel, just a civilian, mm -hmm. but because I like science. I really love science, like that is my thing. So I got to fulfill that. Um, the missionary, right? That's so funny because I, I'm like a humanitarian. I'm the director of events for an affinity group for the AIDS Healthcare Foundation called Spark. So what we do is we go out in the community we nurture these girls up into women, um, teach them about HIV AIDS awareness, um, period poverty, you name it, anything that empowers a woman going out into the community. So I consider that as missionary work. I'm an activist. Um, I was part of the hundred people, hundreds of people that shut down 95 for the George Floyd protest um, in June mm -hmm. of 2020. So like, I'm out there. Um, so I feel like that's my missionary work of the things that I do. And being a lawyer, I'm also paralegal as well, but I don't do any paralegal work <laughs> at all. I just, I just needed to do it, you know what I mean? Like, I, I know some stuff, I know to hell out some contracts and different things like that as a result of having that type of experience. Copy, copy. Um, and what do you do now uh, for uh, so, living? So now what I do for a living, still a conglomerate of things. Um, first things first, I am the CEO of Rock the Mic All Arts, which is a performing arts company. We specialize in independent artist development, which we give showcases that feature spoken word artists, musicians, magicians, dancers, you know, whatever it is that's an art form. Um, so with Rock the Mic All Arts, we offer writing workshops, um, music publishing, um, anything that's like around to help an independent artist, you know, sustain what it is that they say that they are, you know what I mean? And to give a platform for those as well. So that's one of the things that I do. I'm also contracted. Um, I teach STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics um, to a few different schools um, within the area. And that's that's I'll call that missionary work as well, too, because sure. you're placed in um, a lot of inner city schools. You're dealing with children that look for someone to care for them, that look for someone to provide structure because they know that it's not home. They don't have the maturity, the cognizance to say, I don't have structure at home, but they long for it. Right. They long for someone to be like, did you do your homework? You know, th those types of things. So it is a type of a, a missionary type of work. And I'm also a burlesque performer. That's a part of, you know, going with Rock the Mic, spoken word poet. I'd be poetin and stuff like that. I made this word up. It's in the Urban Dictionary. Check Tell it us out. about the word. So the word poeting, a, it's a verb, a poet that is actively writing or performing spoken word poetry. So I'd be poetin and stuff like that. And how did you get your start in uh, poeting? In poeting. I have been poeting for a mm, little over 20 years. Um, I give that homage to Will Bell, the real one, that um, he was, is maybe, oh my God, it's maybe been like 11 years, oh my God, maybe 10, 11 years already that he was murdered um, outside of his poetry spot. Now, this guy right here, like when I say he took over Miami in essence, social media ain't got nothing on him because word of mouth was the most powerful thing thing before social media and text messaging wasn't even really so so popular like that a little over 20 years ago like it cost you if you get a text message you know most people but it was just amazing how that word of mouth got out because you would go to these events and it would be packed people from everywhere people driving from fort myers down in north miami like for poetry for the same love to share that same passion on stage in front of a room full of people in some little dank room you know what i'm saying but it was just the passion you know five dollars to get in and five dollar drinks you know like you cannot beat that on a saturday night you know what i mean like that's probably like the best cheap date you know what i mean especially like in miami that time you look up you used to be like we going to see poetry they was going to hook up after that because she got enlightened y'all felt good he probably only spent like twenty dollars the whole night you know what i mean like 
that was that's where I got my my poeting start from my as you know being a spoken word artist performing spoken word artist now Will the Real One was a celebrity in his own right he yes. actually performed on HBO Def Comedy Jam correct? yes he sure did yes yes right. he did now out of all the uh, jobs that you have <laughs> it sounds like you're, you're Jamaican or something <laughs> Shout out to the Jamaicans. Shout out. <laughs> out of all the jobs that you have, which one is the most challenging? All of them <laughs> are the most challenging. All of them. There's not a moment of a day that does not go by where there is something like my phone's going off now. I, don't, I know it's and some somebody gonna be like, check your email when you're done. You know what I mean? Like that type of thing. So. They're honestly, they're all challenging, especially during the time right now with COVID as a performer, that makes it even more challenging because venues may be open one day and then closed or whatever the case is. So they're all challenging. They're all right now in 2022. All of the hats are challenging right now. All right. On the other end of the spectrum and you can't say all of them, which one is the most rewarding? The most rewarding? I love I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a diehard poet. I love spoken words to the cows come home, but I really love burlesque. Um, having performed burlesque for the last three and a half years, um, I'm mainly known as an erotic poet. So it goes hand in hand. So now I've meshed those two together in my burlesque sets, depending on the venue where I give an erotic poetry set. And then it goes into, you know, burlesque. Um, so that's like the most rewarding because it is it's empowering um, and it's fun and the money's good. Now, <laughs> tell us about burlesque, because uh, there's a lot of misconceptions or um, ignorance about what burlesque is. So how would you define burlesque? So burlesque is the art of striptease. It's an over it's a hundred year old, um, you know, creativity art form and it just, it takes you to the edge to bring you back. So, and as it has, you have classic burlesque, which is where you might see typically um, the white woman, the pale skin and the hair and the very, you know, it's very, very conservative, but it's still a striptease. And then you have neo burlesque where there's actual movement. The music may be different. Um, it may be more whimsical, have a, um, a little bit more satire in it. You know, it's it's sheer entertainment of your sexuality. Um, it's 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 comedy with rhythm, if you will, depending on you know who the artist is, who the performer is, who the burlesque performer is. And how did you get into burlesque? I got burlesque? into that's. I like that you said burlesque because, like, amongst my peers, we label like, I'm burlesque in a night, child. You know, oh, that's yeah, that. I'm going along with. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's the reason why they'd be like, oh, she's burlesquing. So. Um, yeah, wait, what'd you say? How'd you get into burlesque? I got into I got into burlesquing. Um, my burlesque mother is Sophia Luna. She is the founder of Moon River Cabaret, the longest running burlesque cabaret in Miami, in South Florida, actually. Um, at the time, her boyfriend, he's a poet and musician, and he used to come to a spot that I hosted maybe like 12 years ago called Majestical Lips. So they would they would come to hear my erotic poetry, spit that nasty shit. And then I call him we, the names that we give Rio, who he later became my burlesque papa, would be like, L, you need to get into burlesque. L, you need to get into burlesque. And I not not really knowing what it is. The only thing that most people think of when they hear burlesque is Moulin Rouge, Christina Aguilera, or something mm -hmm. like that. That is not burlesque at all. That's singing with sexy clothes on, but it's not burlesque. So I was like, all right, you know, I'll give it a shot. You know, because I'm a diehard poet. So then, you know, as you move along in your career, then, you know, I'm going to these burlesque shows more and more and I'm like, heh. <laughs> do this shit I can do this like I'm hot enough I got the lyrics I can do this so it took for them to groom me I did um, a couple I did their amateur contest and I won people's choice I came second place in people's choice so every time I would enter these contests I'd become first place or people's choice so people's choice actually I didn't care if I didn't get first place I got people's choice because the audience chose me the panel may have chosen someone else based upon different things, your costuming or movement or musicality, um, which is fine. You know, it's not like I scored low on that, but 
people's choice. They were like, we want her. So that's how it just spiraled into there. So then Sophia would book me for her shows. And then I began to get booked by other producers. And then I created um, Trap Burlesque. About two years ago, I waited a little bit to get my feet more wet because I still have to respect the people that were there before me. So like, even though I produce other showcases, I had never produced a full on burlesque show before. So wanting to connect people of color and younger people to understand what burlesque is, to take them out of the strip club, it was, let me put trap on it. So I began to produce trap burlesque showcases where the performers are performing to R&B or heavy trap music. Um, and it looks beautiful, actually, you know what I mean? If you know what to hit, if you have the right trap song. Um, I have a couple of favorite acts of mine that I have like meshed like black musicals like The Wiz and The Color Purple mixed it into trap music. Mm -hmm. So when I do the when I do these acts in certain settings, Every black person in the room knows it. But what's even more amazing that it captures the attention of the white people that probably didn't realize that they know this too. So it's like, that was awesome. I've never seen that before, you know, that type of thing. So mine is just trap burlesque where it is, it's neo burlesque, which is new, but my movements, my costumes still look very classic till the music turns on, then it's something else. And I don't have classic, movements if you will um so one of my taglines is um the chocolate throttle of twerk um ebony enchantress you know different names like that to wow. to right if you're sitting in the audience you're like ebony enchantress what's she about to come do you know what i mean it's it's those things that are like captivating like i want to see what's coming on the stage right now now you seem like you have a very creative and erotic mind uh is this <laughs> Does any of this tie back into your early childhood trauma? No, it doesn't. It's funny you said that because actually when I had this conversation with my cousin, um, she's like, so do you do these nasty poems because of what happened? I'm like, no, bitch, I'm grown. I like to fuck. I experience what consensual sex is. It's great. I want to talk about it. You know what I mean? So like <laughs> that has nothing to do with nothing. You know what I mean? Like I know what what sex supposed to feel like and I want to talk about it and make sure everybody's doing the same thing you know what I mean so yes that is a, a question that is asked it might be that way for other people but it's, it's not for me I'm, I'm just grown would you consider burlesque uh sex work no and I think a lot of people have blurred that line I consider burlesque just like even stripping as selling a fantasy sex work is sex work exactly what it sounds like that it is and i'm not knocking it we have to protect sex workers everybody gotta eat you know what i mean everybody you gotta do your thing you know if, if they want to start taxing us for sex that's a whole nother topic you know what i mean but some people consider consider it as sex work burlesque but because it's actually an art form and if you're not cultured enough to be immersed in the culture then you're going to be like you're going to see tassels and just gyrating like that's sex work. You know what I mean? And then it's like, so if burlesque is sex work and what the hell are the strippers? You know what I mean? Like you would call you would it would probably make more sense to say that they are sex workers before it would be burlesque because we don't get completely nude. Right. Uh, well, some would say that, uh, uh, you know, web camera or some of the only fans girls that and, are sex and, workers and yeah. the adult entertainers the uh, strippers are sex workers uh so that's why i asked the question is burlesque on the line of that or is that i would i would say no and because we don't get completely nude and what we're what we're selling and i could and, and it may be different because i've never sold sex before at least not on purpose but um <laughs> We was on accident. Right. So, um, I ain't know. So like, um, <laughs> if I'm not, I feel like, you know, we're not, we ain't busting it for the dollar. You know what I mean? We're here. We're entertaining. We're going to entertain. We're going to make you laugh and just remember you're alive, you know, that type of thing versus, you know, the strippers. 
ta-da, there's nothing left to the imagination in that case. And that's fine. I don't knock it. I love it. I go, I like to go to strip club on day shit personally. You know, I bring my laptop and do my thing. So I don't knock it, but that's, that's just, I like more of an entertainment aspect of, you know, performing in a sexy way. Just want to be clear that you said your laptop in the strip club. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome. You get work done, you focus. Q elemental P, Q elemental P, you know. <laughs> focus, all right. <laughs> um, can you make a lot of money uh, during the lesson? You can, make, you can make as much as you put into it, just with, with anything. Um, I hear like some burlesque performers like, I don't get booked for nothing, but your costumes look like shit. Your performances aren't polished. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with like your figure, your body, because to me, burlesque is like a body positive thing because men like different things. So you, one female may be a little bit more rounder than the other one. There's a guy that likes that, you know what I mean? So it's just about like what you put into it is what you get out. Would so you say it's more mind control than, than uh, you know, your physical assets. Um, it's, it's a combination of, of like both the same way that strippers are able to go in there and suck your wallet dry like that. It's the same thing. It's the same tactic for burlesque performers, the same thing, the eye contact, the, and you didn't even really take anything off, but your eye contact was so freaking intense that is just, here you go bitch you know what i mean what's your cash at you know it's like it's that you know it's what you put into it so i stay booked because that's what i put into it i put the time into my costumes and my choreography um yeah i i stay booked so it's fine for me and what's the profile of your biggest supporters white <laughs> because that's primarily that know about burlesque um I've gone to some venues where I tell people, tell black people burlesque and they don't even know how to pronounce it. So the fact they don't know how to pronounce it is probably slim that they even know what it is because it might be their first time hearing it. So that's why with Trap Burlesque and what I do, I'm trying to bring that wall down so every black person knows because there are so many historical black performers that have gotten left by the wayside that people don't know about. You got your josephine baker and i feel like that should be the go-to the the whole model of a performer of color um because she was in france and and some people are ignorant some people are very ignorant like ain't no black people in paris like hell you know what i mean so like i've been there there's a lot of black people there's a lot of africa's just over there you know what i mean so um yeah the it's it's mainly caucasian honestly Right. Italian because it's actually like it came from like the Italian stole it from them you know how that go so it was it starts off as Italian so when you go to Paris and Italy they know even the black people everyone knows of burlesque because there is not like Americans where there's like this racial discrimination of we're not gonna talk about all the awesome popular black people you know what I mean in other countries everyone's an awesome popular person um so it's just culturing american black american people to yes black people go skiing yes black people do all the things you think black people don't do we do it all the time every day we've been exposed to it we get it we conquer it and that's what happens you know what i mean so <laughs> where do you like to travel everywhere i my favorite place at the um that i have been i did like um was in Europe for eight days and we did Paris and Amsterdam and various parts of England. Um, Sicily's my favorite place. Um, I was gonna go back, but like everything with COVID and stuff like that, I spent eight days in Sicily. Um, I'm also a house music artist. So I spent time with some producers over there making music in 2019. So it's just getting back over there. Um, but I just, I like European countries. Um, I just anywhere, just anywhere. What's up? You trying to go somewhere? What's up? <laughs> beach or mountain? Um, beach. All right. Definitely beach. I'm an earth sign, so. City or farm? Both. <laughs> <laughs> if I could have 
have like can you imagine like, a look, farm in the, in the yeah if i could have just somebody? like yeah like listen oh that's l's acres with the cow and the horse and the chickens on it like in the middle of the right yeah she's gonna find you if you hit her chicken like, you know, so so corporate both. Building. <laughs> yeah <laughs> have uh drugs ever been a part of your life um it depends no um <laughs> What you talking about? No, um, I smoke weed, smoke weed every day. I'm very 420 friendly. Um, I've had my fun with illicits and stuff like that. Um, but it's like, I'm, I'm an open book. I'm being very honest. Drugs ain't like how they used to be. So I wouldn't, I'm just gonna smoke some weed. Right. Call it a day and. But it's never controlled your life. No, never, 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 never. What do you spend the most money on? <laughs> weed. <laughs> All right. Probably on weed and burlesque costumes. It's like a race. <laughs> it's terrible. Right. And gas. <laughs> so how do you handle stress? Um, I go to sleep. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> like fuck this shit. Yeah. Um, I actually I I meditate. Um, or I'll I'll talk to like a close family member because stress has I've had a history with stress to where I struggled with um anxiety and depression so you know being diagnosed with that like for real diagnosed with that um I have insomnia from time to time so when I don't you know rearrange my stress properly and I think that I'm fine it builds up in me being up for a couple days in a row functioning on minimum sleep because I don't realize you know the anxiety that i have about an underlying issue that i'm thinking that it's okay and in actuality is really not so that's you know one thing to pay attention to your body that's that's something that i can say pay attention to your body because stress will eat you up and you have to pay attention to how you deal with stressful situations so i usually um i don't even smoke weed to like decompress for stress because like Sometimes that could not work out and you go down a rabbit hole of just more negative thinking because you, you know how we can be. So I, I, I like to write naturally poet um, and read when I'm really stressed out. I can probably binge listen a series of audiobooks because it just takes me to like a safe space, you know, being a writer. So I like to read and hear audiobooks. So that's one way of decompressing of a few of the ways decompressing with my stress. What are some of your favorite books? Um, I recently just read um, or listened to a series. I'm actually in the third book, Ivy Smoke. Um, or they're like erotic books because I actually have a book that contains erotic, you know, things. Zane was my favorite author exposed to, I write about sucking dick, you know, like that. I'm like, this bitch is like, I fell in love. Like, this is awesome. Like, and she's black. You know what I mean? So like, you know, going back to like reading her, her books and stuff like that. Um, but the series that I'm reading now, it's like eruption, addiction. They're like all like sex novellas type of things, you know, scandals, the professor sleeping with the student. So and I like those types of things and I like mysteries. Um, and I think mainly that's my background of criminal investigations that I like mysteries, suspenseful type of things because I've actually worked in the midst of mysteries and suspenseful type of cases. Um, and then, <laughs> My most favorite book that I read right now as an adult is Charlotte's Web. Okay. That's like, <laughs> that's like my favorite book. Like it's on my bookshelf right now. I probably had that book since God knows how long. Cause it's like, it's there. I was at a friend's house and he bought his daughter some books and it was like Charlotte's Web, um, the Velveteen Rabbit and Peter Rabbit. And I'm like, dude, Charlotte's Web. And they're like, relax. But I like, I'm like, I still read this as an adult. But that was a book that opened up my creativity as a child. So I appreciate that book still as an adult. And they say if you have a favorite book, you must give it to someone. Do you believe in that? Yes. So I gave that book to my son, but needless to end it back up at my house. But I, <laughs> I gave it to him and he had it for a long time. And he actually just asked me, my where's my book so not that he wants to read it but probably just to have it because that was like 
the first book that I was like, here, kid, want to be smart? Go read that. What you don't know, write it down and we'll talk about it later. You know, that's <laughs> so like I gave that book to my son, Charlotte Sweat. Have your son. How does your son feel about you being a burlesque performer? He, he thinks is he thinks is great. Um, we've had a long history because on top of me, I've I've done modeling for a long time and being an erotic poet, you know, your branding and stuff like that. I've had a lot of risque photos, different photo shoots, things that I've done, which he and I have talked about like over the years, my whole thing would be like, if he's cool with it, like I'm not answering to nobody else. Like I ain't got no man. If my son says, Ma, that's, I gotta take it down. Like this, this is him. You know what I mean? This is, this is his business. This is his mom. So like, I want to respect him. Um, so now with the burlesque, he thinks he's like, Ma, you look really beautiful. But it's just, I haven't gotten him to come out to one of the shows yet. So I figured that I would invite him to a classic burlesque show where he don't see his mama being too wild, but that he just understands the culture, that it's a form of entertainment, that I can bring my son, I can bring my grandparents, you know what I mean, or something like that. At least that's how I feel about it because it can be a very PG show. I mean, everyone has seen a little booty and some tetas before, you know, with pasties or whatever. So, yeah, he's cool with it. All right. How about your dad and mom? So my father, my father is he's a pastor and him not. And he's very old school. So when he hears burlesque, his mind get to think about stuff in the juke joint and just daddy, calm down. Damn, damn. You know, so it took him some time for him to. He says that he's he's not necessarily like OK with it, but he's OK with it if I'm OK with it. And if that's one less dollar I have to ask him for. So um, <laughs> you know, he's like, it's fine. My mom, she loves it. You know, she's like, it's empowering. You look like how I looked at that age. Keep doing it. You know what I mean? Like, so she loves it because for most women, it's empowering. They, they'll live vicariously through me. They may not have the tits to do what I do. So it's like, my mom's like, she's like, you look gorgeous. You know, like she's with it. She definitely, they're, they're both supportive about whatever I do. Do you have any fetishes? Fetishes? No. No. But I do have, I, okay, so maybe this might be considered sex work. Um, I do have customers that have foot fetishes. So you show them your feet, you talk shit to them. So I suppose that would be a form of um, sex work while they're doing their other thing on the other side of the camera. So I don't have any fetishes per se. My fetish would be make money. Um, that's my fetish. <laughs> right there. I hear that. Uh, do you think you've lived a pretty good life so far? Yes, I have. Um, it's been crazy, but I can say that I'm blessed. Um, I still have a lot more years in front of me than I do behind me. So um, I'm just excited to see where my stages of life go because I realize that you still kind of stupid at 35 a little bit, you know, and then the older you get, you'd be like, yeah, I was dumb last year too, you know? So it's like all about, like, <laughs> you know, growth. Um, so I, I've definitely seen a lot. I've been through a lot. So I'm curious to know what's on my path that God has for me. And who do you look up to? Hmm. This might sound like crazy or narcissistic or something, but somebody's got to do it. I look up to myself because I've had to pull myself out of some trenches with the help of God, of course. It wasn't just all me, but um, I've had some mentors, but I, I look up to myself because in hindsight, I'm like, wow, where did I have the strength to go through what I went through? Because I know other people that would have folded first quarter. You know what I mean? So like I, I can say that, you know, I, 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 we have to look up to ourselves. We have to give ourselves credit. We have to be gentle on ourselves. Um, so I, I'm going to give that credit to myself that I look up to myself that I'm very proud of where I've come and where I'm going and everything like that. What are some of the things you do in your downtime? Um, smoke weed, um, <laughs> uh, make burlesque costumes while smoking weed. Um, 
I don't really have downtime. Entrepreneurs don't really have downtime. Our downtime is like random, like in between meetings, like I'm gonna go over here and have some ice cream. You know what I mean? Like, I'm oh, I, I can go do yoga for 30 minutes or I'm gonna go smoke weed. You know what I mean? Like, that's like my downtime. Um, I love to be at the beach. If, if Hollywood would let me pitch a tent and actually camp out there, I would. You know, um, but I love my downtime, my down downtime where like, oh, I'm off tomorrow. Is nothing on my schedule before something gets on my schedule. Let me block off four hours for the beach. You know what I mean? That type of thing. You like to eat, right? I love to eat. All right. So if you uh, were at a dinner table, <laughs> you had five guests to invite mm -hmm. dead or alive, past or present. Who would you invite? <laughs> Let me see. This is funny, and I don't know why the first person that popped in my head was Pac. I'd probably be like, Pac's coming to dinner, you guys. Um, <clears throat> let me see, so that leaves four. So there's, there's Pac. Um, uh, this sounds funny too, but he's actually my favorite actor um, because I'm in that age group. Um, Tom Hanks, I feel like I'd have an interesting conversation with Tom Hanks for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, but just to see Tom Hanks and Tupac at the dinner table at my house, y'all eat collard greens, you know, um, who else? Um, I'd have to say Maya Angelou, Nina Simone, and Michael Jackson. Who am I at four? Was it one more person or am I? I think you're at five. I'm at five. Yeah. Those guys right there. And who would sit at the head of the table other than yourself? Nina. Why Nina? Because... Not anything over Maya Angelou shouts out to her getting her on the back of the quarter. But it's just that her, she had, she had like a, a grace of her, like a, a presence. Um, like a, a I, I feel like she was somebody that I would just love to sit and listen to her talk. Because of her music, the way she conveyed things in her music and when you put words with music it's a different type of vibration that comes from it you know because if, if you love instruments i love raw music raw jazz raw instruments like nobody is performing with like bands and stuff with actual whole full bands coming in and doing their things nobody's doing that so I would just love to be like, you go ahead and sit down, Miss Simone, go ahead. Would you want some extra gravy? You know, like I would just, that would be, I got goosebumps thinking about that. That's dope though. That might be a poem. That might be a poem. Um, yes, I would say <clears throat> Miss Nina. Do you have any advice for anyone looking to get into the burlesque business? Um, do your research first and foremost, because people, there's that fine line that gets blurred between, um, stripping and burlesque so burlesque can get really raunchy really fast if someone doesn't know the history of what it is that it's an actually an art form of movements and removing garments and stuff do your research do your research um because if you don't you won't get booked <laughs> um and if you do it won't be by any decent producers um, you know, it depends on the quality of your show. You'll always be in certain venues. And one thing that, that I can say that I'm blessed about the versatility of my burlesque performance, that I probably would be that token black girl that's in that venue for that. And does that suck in 2022? Absolutely. But we're still doing things. You know what I'm saying? We're still making history. So do your research, man. Do your research. What does that research look like? <clears throat> Research is going back to see what the history of burlesque is. And there's so many, there are a variety of women that have come during the last hundred years of burlesque that you have Latinas, you have black women, you have Caucasians, you have Indians. Look into your cultural background of what burlesque performers were there so you can possibly keep that style alive and put a neo spin on it. Um, you know, everyone's like, you should do a Josephine Baker act. You should be a Josephine. And I'm like, I love Josephine Baker. I love it. Oh, I have a photo shoot that's kind of similar to one of her things. But I want to make history as well. So if I'm constantly 
emulating her, then I won't stand out a hundred years later when some girl wants to do burlesque in the meta world. That's what's happening now. Meta burlesque. Web three. Hold on now. So. <laughs> Might be something you need Might to get be some, yeah, hold on now, okay. Get your goggles. <laughs> right. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, do your research. Uh, you mentioned mom and dad in the burlesque sense. What, what, what importance are those roles? There, there are the people that put you on your way and groom you. And everyone doesn't have a burlesque papa. But the dynamics of how I came into the burlesque scene was because um, Rio, he's actually a host. He's an artist himself. He won the Charlie Chaplin Award 2017. He does like the best Charlie Chaplin impersonations. Um, if you don't know who that is, Google it. Some cool stuff that happened over 100 years ago. Um, so when he met my burlesque mom, you know, she was already a dancer and he was a host. And they were like, let's do this culture here of burlesque. So he would always host all of the shows, which he has gone into a different path now where he does screenwriting and plays and different stuff like that. But he's always gonna be my papa. Um, Rio Dios Mio, that's his name. And um, Sofia Luna, she puts the O's in booty raised by wolves. That's her tagline. Um, so they're the ones that groomed me that made sure I was proper before I got on their stage because of the reputation that they hold. So I had the proper send off when I'm like, guess who called me, who wants to book me? Well, you need to make sure you're on point, bitch. It's a reflection of them, you know what I mean? That they put sure. me out there. Uh, are there male burlesque performers? There are male burlesque performers. Um, <clears throat> so in burlesque, when you have male burlesque performers, they may be doing drag, which is drag is drag, but you'll oftentimes find that in a burlesque show. When you go back into the history of like side shows and stuff like that, when um, you would have like a tent, um, can't even, what are the, is, there's a, uh, I can't think of the name, but there was a type of woman that did like burlesque things, you know, with these circuses and stuff. And then you'd have like the bearded woman you know, different stuff like that where it has transpired from. Um, a lot of times the male burlesque are, you know, males that are, are gay males of the LGBTQ or trans community that do female um, burlesque, you know, female impersonations and it's not drag because drag is something that's different. Then you have boylesque where there are women that are dressed up like men doing it, you know, conveying it and like, they would like disrobe and their like boobs would be taped down and they'd have like a masculine six pack and they'd have like a wee wee print in their pants. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's levels to it. So there are males in burlesque, especially as host. Um, like I have, I have like my favorite host. Um, we call him queen daddy and he's like so Rocky horror show vibe, like the lashes and the eyeliner, like, like if I'm gonna have sex with a guy that has eyeliner on, it would probably be Queen Daddy, but I don't know if he liked me like that because he might be another stuff. But I'm just playing Queen Daddy. Or Prince or David Bowie. Is there room for those guys to come to my dinner? For sure. Um, <laughs> so like, They'll have yeah. to stand though. <laughs> They'll have to stand, that's fine. He'd be, David Bowie would be dancing anyway. What city do you like to perform in? Um, my city, of course. Um, I've performed in a few cities, but it's n honestly, it's nothing like home love for me because it's like you are that local celebrity. You're that, you're that artist. So they, they show you that love, but, um, just performing overall, just as burlesque, just over, in, um, as an artist overall, um, I performed in quite a few cities, but I can say it's really nothing like home, the crib, Miami. Yeah. All right. Uh, how do you feel about President Biden saying that the death of George Floyd uh, was more impactful than what we know as the assassination of Martin Luther King? Um, that shit is wild to me. But it's like if you play devil's advocate when you look at it, um, it was more impactful because it went viral. We're so desensitized from how we were with that assassination right there. We literally watched a man die. 
whether he was right, wrong and different. We watch someone die at the hands of another person that we're supposed to trust, that's supposed to help us. So I don't know about more impactful, but it was very impactful. Um, I don't know about more, <laughs> but it was, it was, it had my ass shutting down 95, you know what I mean? So it, it affected me in that way. Um, but it's very difficult, I feel like, to, to compare the two individuals. If you go down to like individual things, you cannot compare, there's no comparison. But on a humanity level, it's, that was, that was absurd. That was insane. That was, that was insane. But it, I, more impactful, I don't know, but very impactful. Do yes. you think it was appropriate on the celebration of Martin Luther King? Um, no, because that ain't have nothing to do with fucking nothing. That ain't have nothing to do. Shut up. That ain't have nothing to do with what? That's one of those. What? Where, who invited him? That's one of those type of like, you doing too much, bro. Just be quiet. Like, just chill. <laughs> you know what I mean? How do you feel about your vice president? Um, I feel that it's cool that, you know, yay, girl power, black women, all that stuff. But on my own views, I don't know why she's there. I haven't, we haven't, I don't know, but I haven't had a president in eight years. So. <laughs> <laughs> Since Barack, I, was, I mean, everybody have what they want to say about Barack, but they know deep down inside that was the last president that they had to. You know what I mean? <laughs> <clears throat> What's next for you? Um, actually coming up, in April, um, I need everyone to get the Epix TV app. If you don't have that, if you know what Epix TV is, I will be featured as a spoken word burlesque performing artist on a show called Sex Life. So you can go on there now and check out their past seasons to kind of get a gist of the type of show that it is. So we recorded that in November. They're coming back to record the second half of it um, actually in two weeks. So that's what's next, um, getting into bigger platforms of what I do. Um, so you can look forward to seeing me on everybody TV in the spring, <laughs> you know, performing burlesque. So that's, that's what's next to me. Hopefully, um, not hopefully, but patiently waiting for notoriety of what I do because I've been doing this for a long time to have a different type of recognition of what I stand for, you know, for women, um, for women and then black women and um, poets, female poets, you know, it's just so many categories and subcategories to that. Um, that's, that's the, I feel like that's the big thing for me. And more shows, more spoken word showcase, um, more things of the other pandemic, HIV AIDS awareness, um, because that's something that's so near to me just growing up and knowing people that are very 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 close to me that have contracted HIV and during that time with us being so young the only black person that we knew that survived was Magic Johnson you know what I mean so how things have changed now with prep and pep so the next be best big thing for me is to meshing the two my sexuality still con you know with HIV awareness have all the sex you want protect yourself and protect others for sure uh, how can people find you People can find me on Instagram, LAU underscore MII, or you can actually Google Lao Me and you'll find me. Um, I'm mainly known as L. Michelle, as you know, spoken word artist. My burlesque name, performing name is Le Belle Michelle. Um, I'm hashtagable and Googleable. So you can hit any of those hashtags and if you're trying to keep your numbers a certain kind of way, then follow the hashtags. People don't even know you can follow hashtags. Um, yeah, that's how you find me. Rock the Mic All Arts. Totally Googleable. Visit the website, rockthemikeallarts.com. Find out about upcoming events. If you want to write a book, you need proofreading, editing, you need some help publishing some music. We gotcha. Any shout outs? Yes. Um... Shouts out to Sophia, my burlesque mom. Shouts out to um, Maison Marcel Wine, so yummy. Um, shouts out to my mama now. Um, 
just shouts out to people that are just tuned in with L. That's all I can really say. Like, I'm just, my heart is, is big. Shouts out to everyone that fucks with your girl. That's what that is. And one message for humanity. One message for humanity. Be kind. Two words. Be kind. Thank you. <laughs> You've been amazing. You're very welcome. Thank you.